There we go. You can oh. hear me, hopefully? Yes, beautifully, we can. And can and you see my screen as well? I, I, we can see your screen. Perfect. That Carl's going to be talking about environmental impact quoting, uh, 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 a, a Cornell calculator that you can find online that actually allows you to compare pesticides that do the same thing and find which product is going to be kinder and gentler to the applicator, to the environment, as well as the homeowner. So it, it's, it's a cool, unique tool that I didn't stumble on until probably eight months ago. And, and now I'm all excited about it. So <laughs> Carl, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, it seems like it dovetails nicely into the uh, alternatives to glyphosate. I, you know, I came in a little bit late. I've only been listening for 10 minutes or so, but it dovetails in nicely with um, that conversation. I know there's a lot of, um, you know, public scrutiny of, of that specific chemical, but um, what I want to talk about today, this EIQ, Environmental Impact Quotient, is kind of a way we can synthesize a lot of the, the information that surrounds um, those conversations. You know, does it cause cancer to humans? What does it do to the environment? Um, there's a lot of data that goes into, uh, you know, getting pesticides registered and how do we synthesize that data? Um, and the EIQ actually does it by putting one singular number um, to what we'll call risk of that pesticide. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of talk about what the EIQ is today. Um, just an overview, you know, why do we care about pesticide use on turf? Um, we'll talk about the EIQ, how that measures pesticide risk, and, you know, just one number, um, how you can use that EIQ in your decision making, and then some practical examples, um, how we've gotten people over the years to adopt the use of the EIQ and drive their pesticide use and pesticide risk uh, down. So, um, and again, I don't know if, if uh, you know, Brett in the previous presentation talked about the perception of pesticide use. Of course, glyphosate is, is at the center of that a lot of times, but there is, you know, unfortunately a public perception uh, that pesticides are bad. Um, and, uh, you know, I just typed in <laughs> pesticides and golf or grass on, on Twitter, and you can come up with a thousand of tweets like this. Um, and, then, you know, I think in, in a lot of ways, this is unfortunately the public perception, but, um, there's also the perception um, from regulatory government agencies, right? We're seeing herbicide bans. Um, chlorpyrifos is, is one that uh, in New York probably is going to go away. We'll see how that goes. You know, again, in New York, uh, we're not allowed to use pesticides on K through 12 fields unless you get an exemption. Um, and then the glyphosate, again, a, a relevant conversation. Um, you know, that might not be able to be used on uh, public uh, parks, state parks uh, here coming up. So. Um, the reality, though, if, if you look at, you know, some of the research that goes on with pesticide use in turf grass is, is pretty uh, murky, right? And there's on the left are things where um, researchers have found, hey, okay, there's some negative effects of pesticides. Um, you know, in one study, uh, uh, this top one here is, is from one of our uh, entomologists at Cornell, Kyle Wickings, and, and he basically looked at a low intensity and a high intensity pesticide program on, on golf course fairways and found that the high intensity one um, decreased uh, uh, soil microbiology, some of the, the things we like that those critters do down there, uh, nutrient cycling, um, the high intensity program actually um, suppressed those, uh, those valuable traits for a little bit. Um, you know, we find that these residues hang around they can impact water quality. Um, but at the same time, there's there's some good things that we find in research that say, okay, you know, maybe if we have, you know, right up here, I highlighted, if we have a well-established turf, um, you know, that's going to dissipate the pesticide much faster than, say, bare soil. Um, there's, there's a big quantitative analysis of, you know, thousands and thousands of golf course monitoring, uh, golf course water monitoring studies where they found less than you know half percent of surface or groundwater um, have any traces of, of pesticides in there. And then a, a big report recently from from again our Cornell group on uh, neonics in New York and um, you know for turf grass specifically um, there's there's a pretty simple BMP to to protect uh, especially bees from from getting in contact with those neonics and it's just to mow the flowers off before you apply a pesticide right if you've got clover flowering or any other kind of 
uh, weed, weed in their flowering, just mow it off, apply the pesticide, and that really reduces risk. So um, it's, it's a complicated issue. There's, there's a lot of things going on, and, and that can make it um, hard to wrap your mind around, okay, what, what is bad, what is good? Um, and it turns out there's a lot of models out there that attempt to put a number on the risk of a pesticide. And these are just, you know, I think there's eight or nine models here, but uh, there's, there's hundreds of these from different research groups around uh, over the years have tried to come up with a model that takes into account a bunch of the data that's generated um, when you're getting a pesticide approved. That's stuff like, you know, acute uh, mammal toxicity toxicity to fish, um, you know, leaching potential, all these things. They try and throw it in a formula and, and put a number to it. Um, and today, this is what we're gonna talk about, the EIQ, these two on the right. Um, the EIQ and then field use EIQ, which is a subsidiary of that. But um, we're gonna focus in on how these are calculated today and then how that can help you guys uh, make sense of maybe pesticides that, that are, uh, you know, softer, we would say are a little better for the environment versus harsher. Uh, worse for the environment. So, uh, you know, what, what is the reason we like the EIQ compared to all those other ones? Um, well, first of all, it's one number, so that's easy to interpret. High means worse, low means better. Um, it includes a lot of that toxicology data that I was mentioning. Some of those models only focus on maybe one or two data points. Um, the EIQ considers, I think it's 11 or 12, so, and we'll talk about what those are. Um, and then the EIQ, the nice part about it is, is it's the only one that has a website where you can go in and calculate the value yourself. So all those other ones, you would have to search for all the data. You'd have to plug it into a formula yourself and, and calculate it. That seems uh, cumbersome. Uh, the New York State IPM program, again, a, a partner with us at Cornell has developed this website. You can just go in, type it in. We'll go through that today. Uh, you can get a number and uh, the database of all those active ingredients that we find, uh, new ones every year, it is periodically updated by the New York State IPM program. So again, they're doing a lot of that work for you and you don't have to, uh, you know, get into the weeds there. So um, I think this is a good point, uh, Mike, get uh, the participation here, Mark, quiz one. Well, launching quiz one. Uh, quiz one reads, is the EIQ the only way to measure pesticide risk? The question is yes or no. Is EIQ the only way to measure pesticide risk? Yes or no. So as everyone is starting to answer that question, uh, you, you, you mentioned something earlier on where you found out that uh, properties that had heavy doses of pesticide applications, I think you were referring to fungicides, actually started to suppress some of the biology in the soil? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. So they were, Kyle and his group were looking at, uh, this was golf course fairways. So basically they had plots that had no pesticides, uh, plots that had two fungicide applications a year, and then plots that had six applications a year. So the two applications per year was the low intensity, we called it, the six was the high intensity. And um, basically what they found is the species, species abundance um, was down only in that high intensity plot. So, so the low intensity plot and the no, no pesticide plot were actually basically the same versus that um, six applications per year reduced uh, not only the abundance of kind of the microbes in the soil, but also the species richness. So, you know, diversity of microbes is something we like. It, it's kind of resilient in the system. Um, so that high intensity program was, uh, you know, reduced both of those markers, abundance and richness uh, compared to even the low amount and the zero zero pesticide amount. Um, yeah, so so, uh, so so the lower applications may have beat up the soil biology, but they had the, the power to recuperate and potentially the high intensity one, they were just getting smacked around. On, yep. They try to rebuild, but then they'd get knocked down. Exactly, that's how it is, Mike. And there's like a, there's a time component too. So to exactly what you're saying where those two applications, that low intensity period, it knocked them down for maybe a week or two, but then they built back up. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas that six, that six applications per year is is constant bombarding, and if you do that over time, um, you're you're just going to overall uh, suppress that um, those uh, those well, microbes. Yeah. So let, let's answer. And sudden, suddenly, we're not sharing your screen anymore, and I don't know why. Oh, how about now? That's better. 
So the answer to your question, is EIQ the only way to measure, I, don't, I can't even read the question. What was the question? Is EIQ the only way to measure? Oh, pesticide risk. I think that was the pesticide question. Pesticide risk, okay. So, so the answer is no. And 90% of you got that right. Radio, the other 10%, start to listen a little better, please. I'm begging you. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta do my job better here a little bit, maybe. <laughs> so, um, so, so I've been mentioning risk, and uh, this is important because there's a distinction between pesticide use and pesticide risk. Uh, so pesticide use is just um, kind of the number of times you use a pesticide, or maybe it's the pounds of active ingredient you use. Um, the risk is a little bit more complicated, and it's a function of these two things, uh, toxicity and exposure. Um, and toxicity, just like what it sounds like, you know, how toxic is something? Um, you know, my uh, my example is I've got a glass of, of water and I've got, I've got a gin and tonic, right? And the water is not very toxic to me. The gin and toxic, the gin and tonic is maybe a little bit, right? I might get a little bit, uh, you know, inebriated from that. Um, so that's kind of how we view toxicity. And then exposure to is, is the second part of this equation. Um, and that's considering, okay, are you going to come in contact um, with this, you know, chemical or, or uh, product frequently or infrequently so right gin and tonic uh you know could be a little toxic toxic to me if i drink 10 of them in a night i've increased my exposure right that's probably not going to end up uh putting me in a good situation um, but if i only drink one right my exposure is a lot less than that um and, and i'm reducing my risk by reducing the exposure um, like water on the other hand very non-toxic but if i just gulp down water um you can run into issues even even though water is essential for life you can uh, run into issues if you over hydrate yourself so there's this there's this kind of balancing act a seesaw between the toxicity and the exposure and both of those things relate to uh, what we consider risk um, so one of the ways i guess we can reduce our exposure maybe not doing blanket applications but spot treating mm -hmm. exactly uh, you know maybe using crabgrass controls instead of on the entire lawn, go out and do bands around the hot spots. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Mike, that is, it's, uh, and I'll talk about later about how we've worked um, with the EIQ uh, and state park golf courses here in New York to reduce EIQ numbers, but that is a primary way, um, that's the exposure component, right? That if we spot treat um, only kind of in the areas that need it, we're reducing the risk without even changing the chemicals. Um, so today we'll talk about how the EIQ can be used to maybe select softer products versus harsher products, but um, it's also really important to note that you can keep your products the same and apply it to a fourth of the area that maybe you would you would be applying with a blanket application, um, and that is reducing your risk by you know a fourth, um, which which is large. So. Um, that's a good point to make. And if you look at the EIQ equation, this is what it is. It's messy. There's a lot of things going on here. Um, but we're we're accounting for both of those things, toxicity and exposure, just in the EIQ equation. So there's all these measures of toxicity. Again, this is where all that data comes in. We take a look at uh, dermal toxicity, chronic, you know, to fish, to birds. Um, so there's a lot of things here that relate to the environment. Um, you know, chronic and dermal toxicity also relate to humans as well. Um, and we'll talk about how we account for human risk in here too. Um, but then we have exposure, uh, exposure elements as well. So does it does it leach into the water? Can it run off? Does it bind to the soil, or does it readily um, get away from the soil? Those are things that we'd want to know. You know, if, for example, in the equation we have fish toxicity, but um, there wouldn't be a whole lot of risk if something isn't going to make its way into the water, right? So we could have something that's very toxic to fish. It's going to have a higher score in here. Um, but if it has very low runoff potential or leaching potential to get into the water, um, that reduces the exposure and therefore reduces the risk. So again, we're balancing those two things uh, and considering both uh, toxicity and exposure. Um, and then when you say risk, well, risk to who? Uh, as the EIQ is considering risk to a bunch of different people. Um, so in the original paper, from the New York State IPM office, uh, they, they framed it as the farm worker, consumer, and ecological. Um, the farm worker is basically the applicator. Uh, and it turns out the applicator is, is at a very high risk a lot of times um, 
you know, when they're applying the chemical, right? They're in close contact with it. They're, they're out there spraying with it. There can be drift, things like that. That's why we wear PPE. Um, but there's a, there's a term in here that considers just risk to the farm worker. Uh, the consumer, in this case, you know, if you're spraying it on a home lawn, that's going to be the uh, the homeowners who may go out and play on the lawn, may, maybe let their dog run on the lawn. Uh, the people who are coming coming in after um, the application, and then of course there's the ecological, that environmental component, it considers the birds, the bees, the fish, um, arthropods. So we're looking at a bunch of different um, kind of stakeholders in this EIQ formula. You can get creative and you can kind of pull these things out, but um, today we're just going to throw all this thing into a soup and, and make it one number that kind of considers all of those stakeholders. Um, so, you know, I kind of like to just make an example of things, just made up two names here, fabricatazine, pretendazone. Um, and let's just say, you know, fabricatazine, you plug all this stuff into the equation and you get it, uh, you get a number of 15, pretendazone is 30. So what that means is, is pretendazone is a harsher chemical. It's about twice as uh, toxic than fabricatazine if you have the same amount of them. So if I'm holding a handful of fabricatazine and a handful of pretendazone, the pretendazone is the more risky product. Um, but of course, in real life, that's not quite how it works. We have rates. We have uh, active ingredient percentages in products. Um, so, OK, you know, what happens when we have to consider those things? Um, so let's say fabricatazine, the product um, has a 40% active ingredient in it. You apply it at a four pounds per acre rate. Pretendazone has less active ingredient in the formulation um, and also has a lower application rate. So now we start getting into that balance of, of both the toxicity and the exposure. And so how we handle that, so again, just highlighting here that exposure element, um, the rate, the, the for product formulation. Um, how we handle that is the field use EIQ. Uh, and what this is, pretty simple. You just take that EIQ number that the formula spits out, uh, and then you multiply that by the percent active ingredient and the application rate. Uh, application rate, uh, the way we calculate it, is usually pounds per acre. So this is basically going to give you a risk per acre um, of the product. And um, so, so with this example, this is what it would calculate out to. So, you know, at first we would have said fabricatazine, no, it's, it's lower EIQ, it's better, but okay, wait a second, the product formulation, the rate we use it at, um, we get a number of 24, which is higher than this number of six for pretendazone. Um, what we'd say is, okay, after we're considering that exposure element, uh, okay, fabricatazine is actually the harsher chemical. Uh, and if all things are equal, if, if they both work the same uh, for whatever pest we're trying to control, and they maybe cost the same. Um, hey, let's go use pretendazone. It's it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit softer. Um, so, so I think this is a good spot to to stop and do the yeah, quiz too, Mike. Any questions? It's a good spot to launch a quiz, but actually you, you brought up a, a key component to this, where you said if they work the same. Mm -hmm. How do you know if they work the same? Yeah, it's um it, so that's tough. There's you can. Uh, you can consult a lot of the research. So I think Brett was, was talking about some of his research with those glyphosate alternatives. You can look at kind of the plot to plot research that compares chemicals, product A versus product B, and you can try and look at all this research and dig through it and see which ones maybe work best for, for your situation. Um, all right. But there, no, but there's none also, of us are going to do that. Yeah, none of you guys are going to do that. And none in, of us in are going to do that. So how, how do we figure <laughs> that out? Is there yeah, a and you can go to? There, there is, um, and I'm going to talk about that actually in the next. Uh, you know, once we get this poll done, I'm oh, going to go sorry. online to a. Web <laughs> I'm going to go online, and we'll do it interactively. We're going to use a website that um, that I use, and, and Mike, you're, you're, it's funny. You guys are saying you won't do it. I won't do it. I don't want to go through all that information. I want to simplify it too. Uh, and in fact, I, I want to simplify it to the point where I have a number, right? This again, we're, we're focusing on the quantification of a lot of these things. I want a number to tell me, hey, this this mm -hmm. product works this well against crabgrass uh, versus that product. Um, and there's actually a website out there that the Wisconsin folks maintain um, that it's really cool to kind of sift through that data. They've conglomerated all this data over the years. Um, so we're going to get into that and talk about um, how useful that is. 
Perfect, perfect. Appreciate it. Hey guys, I'm about ready to close the poll. So pick an answer. Pick any answer at this point, because we gotta get moving here. Yeah, which is not included in the field UCIQ rate, toxicity, application, timing, or, or exposure. And so we, we're going to close the poll right now, but the answer to the question is application timing. 81% of you folks got that right. So congratulations to those who got it correct. Yeah, we go. All right, you're back up again, Carl. Go get them. Back up, all right. So, you know, we kind of explored okay, what is the EIQ, what does it do? Um, talked about how we calculate it. And um, now I think it's, talk, it's time to talk about the practicality of it. How do we use it? Um, and I, you know, I'm always, uh, yeah, I would be remiss if we didn't include the IPM triangle in here somewhere. Um, one of my, my uh, work mentors has been Jennifer Grant, who was the director of the New York State IPM office for so long, recently retired, but, um, you know, she always liked to focus on this IPM triangle and, you know, we're talking about products and in product selection, but the reality is there's all these things that go into um, our decision to use a pesticide before, before the chemical stuff, right? So cultural practices, physical practices, biological, uh, you know, the basis of your program. How do you mow? How do you fertilize? How do you water? Uh, the growing conditions, right? Is the soil structure okay? Is you know, the growing environment Okay, what is what does the turf grass varieties at, at your site look like? Are they appropriate for that situation? Um, those are all the things we consider before we even get to the point of chemical intervention. Um, and because we we're explaining that the risk, uh, the definition of risk today, all those things are lower risk than pesticides. Um, so again, you know, this is the point in time where we kind of stop and say, you know, I can't cover all that today, but I just want to say all the time you think of those intervention methods before the the chemical part um, i think that's really important to note um, but once you do get to the chemical part uh, there's these three components right and in a perfect world uh, as, a, as a researcher and extension person um, i'd like to focus just on okay what works and and what is uh, harsher or softer according to the iq but the reality is there's also a cost impact in there too so when you're choosing a chemical, I'm sure all of you guys have to figure out, okay, what works, but also what is the cost? Uh, and then what I would say is, okay, let's consider the EAQ um, right after those two things. Uh, I'm not saying it's the first thing it, it, that should come into your mind. I think you have to find something that works and something that's uh, at a price point you can afford. Um, but given a situation where you have equal efficacy, maybe an equal cost, then I'd say, hey, use the EIQ and uh, maybe come up with um, that as your decision-making tool. I'm going to choose the softer one versus the, the harsher one. So, um, you know, Mike, you asked the question earlier, okay, are there some resources out there that we could use? Um, and there definitely are resources. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of my PowerPoint really quickly and I'm going to bring up um, that one resource we were talking about. You can see this, Mike? Yeah, I can say it. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so this is a website maintained by uh, the UW Madison folks at Wisconsin, turfpests.wisc.edu. Uh, I'll throw that in the chat box, the, the link there um, when we're done a little bit here so you can access it uh, after. But um, basically what this website is, is um, a way to search for how well a product works um, based on the pest you're trying to control. Um, and so I just want to go through an example today. You know, I, I think we're already kind of talking about weeds today. Um, <laughs> the weed that, that I have experienced most, at least in the Northeast, crabgrass um, seems to be the one we care a lot about. I'm just going to select crabgrass today, but you can literally list any, any weed problem you've got. You can select that. And, and when you click submit, it's going to take a little bit and then it's going to generate a table. And it's going to say, okay, here's some common product names. Um, and then the rating thing is, is what I really like. They've gone through all this research. There's a group of researchers that have reviewed all the, the research data out there. And they said, um, okay, we're going to group things that work really well as fours. So if you scroll down this list, there's a lot of products that are fours. Um, but then there's products that are threes that work okay. Not quite as, as good as the fours, right? You can keep scrolling. You're going to get the twos, right? Okay, now we're not working so well. 
uh, and ones are things that that have um, crabgrass on the label but maybe don't work very well at all based on that research so um, you know they've conglomerated a lot of research here and made it very simply simple to access um, so you know if we're thinking about crabgrass I kind of look at these two right here that I see a lot uh, pendulum dimension 2ew are just kind of the common product names but the active ingredients in these um, pendomethylin and, and pendulum and dimension uh, has a dithiopia as the active ingredient so um, let's say you know those are kind of the two common ones I use okay they both work well um, you know I don't really know the cost of those two products but let's say they're pretty similar um, that's the, the case where we'd start to say okay Matt now maybe the EIQ is something we're going to use as our decision making tool um, so to do that we can go I'll flip over here to the EIQ calculator um, you can just type in uh, EIQ calculator into Google it's going to send you to this page uh, so again this is this is uh, handled by our New York State IPM office um, so they keep this big old database of all active ingredients um, when new ones come out they try and review those but it's, it's again pretty simple so this is something all those other pesticide risk models don't do they don't have this website where you can literally just choose an active ingredient um, so I'm gonna uh, the dithiopyr um, formulation here I've got some notes so we'll click, go down okay where's dithiopyr there we go and then you can enter the active ingredient percentage usually we got products that have 24 percent uh, and then rate of application the nice part here is is you don't have to convert to pounds per acre you can put it however um, you guys use it on the label so pints per acre two pints per acre is a pretty common rate I saw there for that thiol care products and then you just click submit um, and so here we go so it tells me here's what I put in um, dithiopyr the base EIQ remember that big formula that spits out something um, it's going to tell me 15.7 is the value there um, so okay that's kind of on the low end of things uh, but field UCIQ so when we consider the rate uh, and the product formulation 7.6 um, so that's actually pretty low uh, you know just in general a, a good a good number if you can stay under 25 I'd consider that's very soft um, 25 to 50 would start to be getting to kind of a medium level of, of risk um, 50 to 100 gets into the high portion and then anything over 100 on this field UCIQ marker uh, is uh, we call that very high risk so um, this you know dithiopyr products if you're using them for crabgrass control very low field UCIQ um, and it's actually cool you can look at the breakdown of, of how uh, of those stakeholder groups so for the applicator and for the you know maybe person who's going to be walking on a lawn afterwards it's, it's pretty low um, and we see that ecological component is higher right so this is pretty typical of, of most pesticides they're going to have a higher ecological number but um, you know if you wanted to use this website and only maybe you say you, you really want to just look at that environmental component um, you might just look at the ecological field UCIQ here and you might make some decisions based, based on that so um, there's some flexibility in here but the overall number 7.6 is very low um, so let's think back to okay that uh, the product with pendomethylin in it okay I want to compare so now I'm going to go through I'm going to do the same process pendomethylin um, 37.4 is a pretty common active ingredient percentage and then 4.8 pints per acre pretty quick took 10 seconds so again spits it out um, if we look at the EIQ value um, so remember dithiopyr was right around 1516 um, this right away is 30.2 so we already kind of know okay that you know if we have apples to apples comparison um, the same amount of both pentamethylin is worse um, and then if we consider the um, the formulation the exposure component right uh, 54.2 is, is very high so if it's starting to get into kind of high risk um, so we'd say based on this information um, yeah pentamethylin is the harsher product um, and that's not to say that you should always choose uh, dithiopyr products compared to pentamethylin you know if they're cost different if you're looking at a different weed to control um, maybe those have different efficacy but in this case if we've got a crabgrass to control and they're about the same price I'd say hey go with the dithiopyr because it's a lower um, field ECIQ um, 
and actually, you know, again, if you're concerned about that environmental component primarily, um, oh yeah, okay, that's way higher. We were at 16 with that diop here. We're at 131 with um, pendomethylene. So um, I so think that's the, kind of the... The closer to zero, the better. Mm -hmm. That's what our goal is. Closer to zero is better. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can tell you, because I've done the numbers, for diamine is like two or three points higher than the dithopur or the dimension types products. So mm -hmm. it has a much kinder, gentler package. I, I, I find it, it, when I go to the big box stores right now, and I look at the pre-emergence that they're selling in a bag for homeowners, do you know what the active ingredient is in all of those? And the methylene. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and so from, from, guys, from our industry right now, most of you folks, if I'm not mistaken, you're using prodiamine or uh, dimension. So you already are offering up a kinder and gentler program than, mm -hmm. than what, what they're pushing out of the big box stores. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, Mike. Uh, you, you may just be already using products that are softer. Um, and I think that could be something um, that you can talk to, you know, if you have clients and say, hey guys, you know, if you were to go to the big box store and do this yourself, um, what they're going to provide you might be a lot higher in EIQ environmental impact than say what we're using. So, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of the decision process in, in an ideal world that I would like to see as, as a, someone who researches this stuff. Um, you know, just a couple more resources here. That Purdue link is to uh, Aaron Patton and his uh, um, weed folks at Purdue and, and a bunch of other folks have reviewed, every year they review that, uh, all the herbicide trials and all the weed control trials and and they have a, a big book it's like 120 pages but that just outlines all that data so um a lot of that underlying data goes into the free turf pest uh wisconsin website there but um if you want all the nitty-gritty stuff um that's a really good resource that purdue resource um it's like 20 bucks i think hard copy um online you can get a pdf for like three or four dollars i think so um that's it, always it's a, it's something. A, it's a great PDF. I have it on my in my Dropbox on my phone, and I get a lot mm -hmm. of questions. People think I'm smart, not very smart. I just can open up that book and find the answers that they're looking for. Yeah, it, it's it's the, super cool to have it on your phone. Uh, and and that Turf Pest uh, website too from Wisconsin is mobile compatible, and you might have noticed that from when I was navigating it on the computer here. But that's a super easy thing click a couple clicks on your your smartphone there um, and you can get some real-time data in the field which is really cool um, so and, and the Wisconsin one has on it weed controls and fungicides but I didn't think it had insecticides yeah it's got um, so you're right the efficacy data is w when they could put a number to kind of how well things work is uh, really only in the diseases, controlling diseases and weeds part. Um, the insects is, you know, it's not to say there's no research at all on insects, there's lots of research, but um, it's hard to kind of get consistent insect pressure. And and when you're looking at research data, you know, we always look at, well, okay, okay what, what pet kind of level of pest pressure was there in the trial? Um, if there was high pest pressure, okay, that's good. We can tell which products worked, which didn't. If there's low pest pressure, you know, let's say it's you didn't get many grubs or ABW or whatever they're trying to control, um, there's a lot more variability in there, so they can't really put a number to things. But um, you can still kind of go in and find insecticides that have a certain pest on the label, um, which is still good to use. But uh, yeah, there, there's no real uh, of that efficacy four three two one data um, on the insecticides there. I did notice that on the EIQ calculator, occasionally a product I'm looking up isn't on the calculator. Um, mm -hmm. Case in point, Solero, not on the calculator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, um, so sometimes it can be maybe they're in the process of reviewing it if it's a newer product. Um, but then there's also the case of, you know, I, in that big formula, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of toxicology data and that's not always available for every product. Um, so sometimes, 
you know, they can review a product might be older, but they just don't have enough data to say, um, hey, we can calculate an EIQ for that product. So, um, you know, that's commonly what happens. Sometimes they just haven't posted their revisions. So, um, like with that sort of stuff, if people are using, playing around with the EIQ calculator, Mike, they can always just uh, email New York State IPM and say, hey, you know, I noticed this wasn't on your calculator. Um, just wanted to see if that was something they're in the process of viewing, if there's data. Um, and sometimes it's good because that's how they find out about new products. Um, it's usually how I find about found out find out about new products is people saying, oh, it's not on the EIQ. Oh, I haven't heard of that. Okay, let me pass it on to New York IPM. They're going to review it. So um, if you guys run into that issue, just always shoot them an email and, and see what the deal is there. Perfect. I'm going to, I'm just going to ask you, could you get Solero on that for me, please? I'll try and get Solero. What's the active in, in Solero? Okay. Again, I've told you I'm not very bright. And so I don't know all of this stuff. I'll have to look it up. Don't embarrass That's okay. Me. Okay. I'm going to launch the next quiz. And so the quiz question is when I notice a pest, I should first grab the sprayer. Research which, which pesticide will control and which pesticide is the most effective. Investigate cultural, physical, biological methods of control. I hope everyone gets this right. It's, it's definitely going to be grab the sprayer. Definitely. <laughs> grab the sprayer. <laughs> Yes, yeah, goes back. Well, seventy-eight percent of people are going to get it right. Okay. That's what I can tell you. Do, 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 do. So I don't know what's coming up, but I I know that you've got real life experience on some major league golf courses that have been using EIQ for for several years now. Are you going to share that story with the group? Yeah, we are definitely going to share that. I think that's, um, you know, I think that's so important, Mike, when you're talking to, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm in here in the ivory tower, academic, and talking about theory, and uh, I'd love for you guys to use the IQ in decision making, you know, and I think what people really want to know is, has this been used? Have other people, practitioners, used this thing? Um, have they had success with it? And so that's what we're definitely going to talk about is our New York State IPM. Um, project with them we've worked at beth page for it's it's going to be um it's going to be over two decades this year that uh the cornell turf program and, and the new york state ipm office have worked with beth page uh and then since then we've expanded that out to a bunch of the state park golf courses here in new york um but essentially yeah i'm going to look at um how the eiq is kind of the crux of how we evaluated their pest management program and how we've kind of monitored that through the years and I'll talk about how they were able to use it to their advantage and, and kind of the results we've seen. Perfect, perfect. All right, so let's, everyone has submitted the quiz. So uh, the question is, when I notice a pest, I should first, well, 80, 74% of you got it right, investigate cultural, physical, and biological methods of control. 25% went right for the pesticide, researching the pesticide, and 1%, myself included, grab that sprayer. So yeah, okay. uh, we're gonna close. I'll that. take that. I'll take if you if you answered research. Um as long as you didn't say grab the sprayer, Mike, shame on you. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I embarrass myself. You're back up. <laughs> All right. So um yeah good transition right into it, Mike, is the practical uses. Um so you know we're talking about it mostly today about that product versus product comparison. Uh, I'll call that product swapping. Um, so you can just say, hey, this product is lower the IQ, this one's higher, I'm going to choose the lower one. Um, but you can also do this on an annual basis. And this is how I've done it with the golf courses I've worked with, um, is you can use the EIQ to just add up all the pesticides over the pesticide applications across the golf course for the whole year. And you can say, okay, what was my final number? Was it higher or lower than last year? Um, and that's how you can track improvement. Uh, now we've gotten to the point, I won't share the data today, but we have pest uh, pressure models for common uh, disease diseases that kind of the thing we're worried about on golf courses, things like dollar spot and thracnose brown patch. Um, 
we've got disease pressure models. So now every year we kind of sync up, okay, what was the pressure for dollar spot this year? Was it high, was it low? And then, okay, when did you apply things for dollar spot? Was it during the high, high pest pressure, low pest pressure times? Um, so that's kind of why I, get, I won't talk too much about that today, but again, kind of more ways we've used the EIQ, but um, just to, to get to that annual kind of number, how do we calculate that? Um, again, it's pretty simple. So you just take that field use EIQ. So again, remember that remember that uh, accounts for the, the active ingredient percentage, the application rate. So um, then you just multiply that by the number of acres an application was made to. So if you made a, an application to green, you know, just the greens on a golf course, maybe that's two acres. You just multiply whatever the field use EIQ was times two, boom, that gives you a number. Um, and then that's all additive. So Okay, let's say you go two weeks after that, you apply the same thing, same, uh, you know, to the green complexes, um, you just add that number in uh, and you can sum all that up. You can do it just for greens. You can do it for just your fairways. You can do it for your whole property. Um, so it's pretty flexible in that, in that regard. Um, if we're going back to our, uh, you know, our fake products here, um, let's take Fabricatazine and let's say we're applying it to something like greens, two acres. Um, take that field ECIQ, multiply it by 248. And then let's say, well, pretend to zone, maybe we're going out on some rough areas. Maybe we're treating, we're spot treating a couple uh, rough areas around fairways or something. Apply it to four acres. Um, we're going to get a number of 30 at the end there. So um, again, this is another way to account for the exposure, how much area are you applying it to. Um, so that, that pretend to zone, uh, is, is still lower, uh, not quite as low if you were just to look at if they were both applied to one acre, but um, this is just kind of showing you again how we how we use this um, kind of in the golf course spectrum. Um, so again, going back to this project, it's it's going to be 2000 was the, the start of this project uh, and kind of some background on how it got started is um, the state park kind of leadership and the governor at that time were looking at pesticide use, um, not unlike today, looking at golf courses and saying, um, they asked the question, which is a good question, um, can you manage, can you take care of a golf course without pesticides? Um, so who they go for, who do they go to with that question? They went to uh, Jennifer Grant, New York State I IBM office. And then uh, the professor I work for here at Cornell, Frank Rossi, um, they asked those two folks, uh, hey, Frank and Jennifer, you know, we'd like you to experiment, experiment around with this. Um, do you think it's possible? And they said, uh, well, we got to test it somewhere. Um, <laughs> and so it just so happens that um, the testing ground was going to be Bethpage State Park. Um, so for those who don't know, Bethpage State Park uh, most famously has the Bethpage Black Golf Course, um, which has, you know, has had US Opens, PG Championships, tour events, um, but it's got four other courses there. Um, and one of the other courses is the Bethpage Green Course. Um, so it's right alongside actually the Bethpage Black course for, for a lot of it. Um, and so that was the, the place they decided to test it. And they said, hey, we're going to have six greens out of the 18 where we're going to do just what we normally did. Uh, we're going to have six greens where we have kind of a, a EIQ, IPM focused element uh, at that time. Things like routine top dressing, routine airification um, work quite as widespread as they are now. Um, so they kind of implemented those cultural practices, but also um, were choosing lower EIQ products. And then they had six, six screens where they did no pesticides. Um, and it, if uh, long story short, the no pesticide program did not work. But uh, so those greens died. And that was a very difficult thing for the uh, superintendent of the black course to look at, who was having a US open around those times and people are parking next to dead greens on the Beth Page green course. But um, what they did find that was, was promising was that kind of EIQ focused program uh, worked just as well as their conventional program. And so that was the basis of saying, okay, well, we can't do no pesticides, but if we use this EIQ in the right way, if we choose softer products, we can get the same results. Golf courses, golf, uh, golfers didn't know the difference when they surveyed them um, between the conventional and the EIQ focused program. So uh, that was kind of the, 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 um, the start of this, uh, this project and has continued and we branched it out to a bunch of golf courses now. Um, and so this is what we get every year. We have 16, uh, 15 golf courses in the state program. 
um, they send us their pesticide records every year and we just calculate EIQ. Um, and so when we started doing that in 2011, um, you could see it didn't work right off the bat. Um, it actually didn't work well at all. It did the opposite. Um, so you see the average goes up, the median, you know, the, the middle golf course there every year goes up. And so, you know, part of this was um, the first couple of years we were emphasizing some things that, that a lot of superintendents hadn't heard of before. Um, identifying properly what kind of pest there is, scouting and keeping records and, and developing pest thresholds. Um, you guys know all about that, I'm sure. But um, you know what you know Frank and Jennifer noticed in that time period was um, if we create the awareness that there are pests out there, um, we teach people to identify the pest better, we keep them scouting and, and kind of aware at all times of um, what diseases and weeds and insects are out there. Well, they're going to notice them more and then they're going to spray for them more, um, which is basically what happened, uh, which is very interesting. Those first couple of years, we saw that increase. Um, but what we did know, and once people kind of started uh, doing a better job of those IPM uh, practices, scouting and record keeping, uh, is we noticed that most of the risk, more than 50%, was coming from just treating two pests. Uh, and that's dollar spot, the disease, uh, and annual bluegrass weevil, which continues to get. Um, you know, worse, um, especially in that Long Island area. So we said, okay, um, so we're gonna focus in on those two things. So then after those first couple of years, uh, Frank and Jennifer shifted and, and Bob Portmas, who worked on this project before I did, they shifted to say, okay, we're gonna focus on those pests and we're gonna figure out where we're spending, you know, quote unquote, spending our EIQ on. And it turns out that big, big uh, land areas, fairway areas that are, you know, 25 acres of fairways on most golf courses, rough areas that are, you know, 30, 40, 50 acres of rough. Um, we're going to focus on those big areas because they contribute a lot to the EIQ. And uh, so we're going to promote a couple things. We're going to do the product swapping, which is just, you know, take this jug out, put this jug in um, using the EIQ. So let's take this harsh chemical away. Let's give you a soft one. Um, but also, Mike, you mentioned earlier the spot treatment method where you can really make a lot of, of reductions in environmental impact if you just treat less of the area. So um, this is really key for annual bluegrass weevil treatment. Um, you know, up until that time, basically, they would spray most of the rough or most of the fairway um, with an ABW control. And then, you know, once we kind of learn more about the ABW lifestyle, how they start kind of in the long grass areas on the on the peripheries of the hole and then as the, the season warms up in the spring they kind of move inwards um, if you're scouting well enough you can see okay they're about to get to the fairway instead of spraying the middle of the fairway where they're not going to be in the spring let's just spray the edges because we know they're out there um, and, and that method of spot treating you know that turns a 25 acre application into you know a four application five acre application um, that leads to big reductions in EIQ. So we were promoting that. Uh, and then at times when you could eliminate applications, you know, that's the way to go. And um, that goes back into kind of knowing when there's uh, high pest pressure, right? So dollar spot is one that we have a model for now, but, you know, essentially, okay, if, if, if pest pressure, if dollar spot pressure is low, don't, don't make an application, right? You're gonna be okay. Um, if it's high, go ahead. Um, so using these techniques kind of different ways um, was what we promoted. So once we started implementing those, um, you know, we started to see that the reductions come back down. And um, so now we're, you know, pretty stable, right? Uh, 2020 data isn't fully in yet, but um, we've gotten to a point where um, we're, we're choosing softer products. We're trying to do more spot treatment um, and uh, and we're being more, um, thoughtful about kind of when we need to apply pesticide. Um, so it ends up being 38% reduction since that high in 2013. Um, and, and so, you know, just to mention, um, so Beth Page Black is included in this data. Uh, and the really, the cool thing from there is, um, you know, they held the open, uh, the PGA Championship in 2019, um, and their, their pesticide risk was actually lower than the couple years before that. So they continue to be a really good example of a high level golf course, you know, one of the best in the world um, that uses this data and um, can reduce risk even in a year where they're holding 
uh, you know, one of the best four golf tournaments in the world. So, um, you know, just uh, if you're starting with the EIQ, I think today, hopefully I've just kind of um, created some awareness about what it is. And if you want to get started, I'd say first thing, just toy around with that EIQ calculator. Go on the website, kind of type in the products you use. Um, you can kind of use that uh, those numbers that I was throwing out earlier. You know, if it's below 25, that's good. If it's above 100, you know, that's bad. Um, so just kind of see what you use and and then you can start researching alternatives. Um, that's when you go to that, that Wisconsin website. That's a really good place to start. Um, you could buy that Purdue book. You can, you know, use your own methods to um, to see what the alternatives alternatives are. And, you know, again, toy around with the EIQ calculator, see how that lines up. And then if you really want to get into it, um, calculating yearly EIQ units um, is something that's a little harder. Um, but if you want to do that, uh, I've got a spreadsheet that makes it super easy. Um, basically, all you have to do is enter in the applications you made. Uh, my spreadsheet will all automatically calculate all those EIQ numbers for you. There's a summary page. Um, so if you get to that point, uh, you know, feel free to email me and, and I'll send you the spreadsheet, um, which is uh, which which makes it a little bit easier than if you were to, you know, go through every application on the EIQ calculator. That would be cumbersome. So, um, you, you know, you know Carl, I, think I, I, I still don't think you sent this to me and I, I, I asked I, for it. I thought I sent it to you. No, I sent it Did, to you. After I, don't, last time. I don't remember saying it. No, no. But, so, uh, so, I, so I got to follow up with you there, Mike. And, and if people actually, if they want, um, you know, I don't know if people use Google Sheets, which is kind of the online version of Microsoft Excel, but I've got that. I've got this spreadsheet also in an online format, um, which can be nice if you're out in the field and you want to put it in on your phone um you know, that's also an option too so um again feel free to reach out to me and, and i'd be happy to share this um this spreadsheet with you guys thank you so so, so, so that's all i've got today mike um but would love to take some questions got any questions uh, out there 